I got screwed. <laughs> you promised me. I was in line last night. He sold some guy, you know, six tickets for five dollars. When I got there, he said it's five tickets for six dollars. <laughs> and promised me I would win, and so much for that. <laughs> you had to say that, didn't you? All right. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Tom Brady, Jr. <laughs> and I haven't had a drink since July 20th, 1965. <laughs> Look like the midnight cowboy coming up here. If y'all came here tonight to hear anything uh, deep and wise and profound, you're free to leave right now. <laughs> uh, I have severe brain damage. Matter of fact, I only have two neurons left up here. Every once in a while they bump together and I have a brain fart, and that's my <laughs> deepest thinking. And, and that's okay. They, they say some are sicker than others, and I'm a living example of that. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love it with all my heart. I think it's the finest, most effective, life-changing program on the face of God's earth. Nothing touches it. <laughs> you know, it saved my life. It gave me a brand new life. It gave me a sense of belonging. And it gave me a family. Alcoholics Anonymous is my family. Now, I don't know any of you here or many of you here, but you're my brothers and sisters in Kansas. And I'm happy to be a member of your family. Because without the love and support of my family in Alcoholics Anonymous, I would never have made it. It still amazes me when I wake up some mornings and I realize that I haven't wanted a drink in so long. It really blows my mind, and I have to think, why? Why was this gift given to me, this gift of a brand new life, a transformation of my character, a real spiritual death and rebirth and regeneration being made all over again by the grace of God in this program? Why me? Did I deserve it? No. Is it because I'm so smart and good-looking? I am smart and good-looking. Shit, I mean, you know, give me something. I'd... And the answer is no. You know? I was getting some quiet time this afternoon, and, and I thought about a, a psalm in the Bible, which uh, is not conference-approved literature, but I found it does not bite. There's a psalm in there, Psalm 116. I invite you to read it when you go home tonight. I call it the Alcoholic Psalm. And it explained to me what has happened to me. There are some lines in there that say, The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Now, if we can get the musicians up here, we'll sing just as I am and go home. Now, I am not a simple person. I never have been. I'm a very complicated, confused, mixed bag of feelings and thoughts and, and behavior most of the time, and I probably always shall be. There's nothing simple about me. So how in the world did I get simple enough and get low enough for God to save me? I brought myself there. Part of my complicated self exists in the fact that I'm a person who's always believed that anything that feels good should be done to excess. <laughs> my philosophy has always been, if it feels good, overdo it. <laughs> well, sometimes when fe food feels good, I eat too much. Sleeping feels good, I sleep too much. I remember when I found out sex felt good. I was by myself, just like all of you were. <laughs> I 
And in spite of some warnings from my mother <laughs> about a certain enough part of my anatomy rotting off, and I was going to go blind, <laughs> it felt so good I figured I'd keep on till I got nearsighted. <laughs> I'd like you to know I succeeded. <laughs> Another part of my mixed bag is I'm the kind of guy that likes to do everything at once and do it all perfectly. If I got ten jobs to do, I'm going to do ten jobs all at the same time. Y'all ever tried to pee, comb your hair, and read a newspaper all at one time? <laughs> now, women may be able to do that. <laughs> but when you're six foot three, you're going to mess up something when you try that. <laughs> Often in the morning when I wake up, my mind's going 500 miles an hour with it. I got it, I got it, I got it. I'm bouncing off the walls, you know, in five minutes. I don't know what the hell it is that I've got to do that's so important, but it seems important at the time. Now, a psychiatrist would call that obsessive-compulsive disorder. I'm a cartoon fan. I call it the Tasmanian Devil Syndrome. <laughs> Another part of my mixed bag of conflict. You know, I, I've always wanted quick results with as little effort as possible on my part. <laughs> Psychiatrists say we have, we're unable to delay gratification. I call it, I can't wait to get to the center of the damn Oreo. <laughs> I've always been a great starter and a poor finisher. Any of y'all have that problem? <laughs> Everything I do, I got two basic speeds, fast forward and stop. And you know, in my life when I'm hurting, it's in fast forward. <clears throat> help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. And then something bad happens. I feel better. And I put it on stop. Doesn't seem like a big problem, does it? How many people you've seen come through the doors of this program die? I saw one here last night, man. Worst case of DTs I ever saw. You see that man yelling, flipping down the aisle last night? <laughs> that boy may not want help, but he damn sure needs it. <laughs> and you see them come in the door, and they really want wanting help. They're begging. <laughs> and in two weeks, they're in a spiritual relationship. And in two weeks and ten minutes, they're drunk again. <laughs> I always saw things in either-or terms. Either it's tall or it's short, it's black or it's white, it's good or it's bad, it's the best, it's the worst. And I left out the whole middle of life, which is where life really is. I judged myself by those standards. If I wasn't the best, I was automatically the worst. I know I was in the Al-Anon meeting one night. I stick my head in every now and again to learn something. <laughs> and they said, oh, Tom's here. Tom, talk to us about balance. <laughs> I said, I don't know nothing about it, but it must have something to do with that point I pass on the way from one extreme to the other. <laughs> now, I didn't say I was that way. I said, I am that way. And it's okay. Because I have a program to deal with it. Once you can accept the fact that you're a dipshit, it's okay to be a dipshit. <laughs> and because of these and my other faults, I was brought low. And God, through His grace, you know, I, God put up with a lot of crap from me, y'all. And looking out there at y'all, he put up with a lot of crap from y'all, too. <laughs> but God's good. Totally good. His name is hallowed. That means no bad can come from God. God loves unconditionally. I can't even understand that. He loved me when I was out there drinking and, and doing everything that violated my own value systems as much as he loves me right now. How do you comprehend that? Maybe that's the reason he's God. And he saved me. Because when I got low, finally, I got real simple. I got simple enough to take directions. And that's the reason I'm here tonight. I hear people talk at meetings about surrender. I hear some eloquent talks about surrender. You can talk about surrender until your ass falls off. 
If you're not taking directions, you are not surrendered. They brought me into this program. Spiritual program, Alcoholics Anonymous is. Spiritual program, that means it's simple, but it ain't easy. That means it's firmly based on the fact that we can do together what each of us cannot do by ourselves. And it requires action, not thought, not feelings. It is action-based. Psychological programs are thought-based, and it's been my experience that one thought produces another thought. And which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And if they're based on feelings, my experience has been one feeling produces another feeling. This program is about changing character. And character is not changed by thinking. Character is not even changed by praying. People have problems. They say to me, well, I'm praying about it. I'm praying about it. I said, are you following up on your prayer? When you ask God for something, are you getting out there and trying to make that thing happen? Then don't waste your time and don't waste his time if you're not. I heard a story one time about a rabbi and a priest went to a prize fight. And before the fight began, one of the fighters got down on his knees in the corner and did this. And the rabbi turned to the priest and said, that's one of your boys, ain't it? <laughs> he said, yeah. He said, well, tell me, what does this mean? And the priest said, not a damn thing if he can't fight. <laughs> This program requires action. How many times do we see that in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous? Action. More action. 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 They even reach into the Bible. Faith without works, said old James, is dead. You tell me about your faith, I'll show you mine. You believe in God? Big deal. So does the devil. Spiritual program. And because it's spiritual, too, it's so common sense that I missed it for years. A little child can understand this program. Matter of fact, children understand it better than we do. You know? For instance, the entering steps into this program, steps one, two, and three. You know, when I was a little kid, I knew intuitively, without anybody telling me, when a problem was more than I could handle. And I knew intuitively that if it was more than I could handle, that if I got somebody bigger and gave them the problem, the problem would be solved. Everybody in here practiced the first three steps 10,000 times when you was a kid. And yet we sit around meetings and philosophize and analyze about it. And we must exercise these little things up here. But these steps are simple. You know, I had a friend when I was a kid. His name was Ronnie. The filthiest kid I ever knew in my life. Ronnie stunk, man. <laughs> his nose run all the time, picked boogers out of his nose, put them in his hair, twist his hair up on his head, stuck out like that. Wipe snot on his elbow. And Ronnie's mom and daddy were street drunks. He didn't have anybody to take care of him. And I loved him. He was a good friend of mine. He was hard to put up with unless you could hold your breath for a long time. <laughs> I'd take him home with me every now and again, and my mama would meet us at the door, and she'd wash Ronnie up, you know, and invite him in for supper, and we'd play for a while. And I loved the kid. And I could beat Ronnie at two things. I could outrun him, which was good, because I scared death of Ronnie. And I could beat him shooting marbles. Now, the rules of a marble game, for you uninitiated, you shoot marbles. If you win, you get the marbles. And I'd win, and Ronnie would take my marbles. But I knew what to do. I go get my daddy. I said, Daddy, Ronnie got my marbles again. He said, You win, son? I'd say, Yes, sir. He said, That's not right. Let's go get your marbles. Now, I think Ronnie stole my marbles just to get to see my daddy. Because we'd go over there. He'd say, Ronnie, you get Tommy's marbles? Yes, sir. Did you win? No, sir. That's not right, son. Give them back. Okay. <laughs> now, next time you philosophize about the first three steps, the first step says, I have lost my marbles and I can't get them back. <laughs> And the second step says, I get somebody bigger, I'm getting my marbles back. 
And the third step says, if I ask that bigger one to get them back, I get my marbles back. <laughs> it's so simple. And, you know, we never forget that. We think we're so wise and everything. You never forget that. You all remember being down on your knees in front of the toilet bowl, puking your guts out? Did you holler for a higher power? <laughs> Did you intuitively know somebody bigger than yourself could solve that problem? Did you make that promise like I did? God, I don't want to be this way. I hate myself. I don't want to keep on doing this. I'm sick. Please help me if you'll get me over this and I'll never do it again. Did you ever stop to realize that God got you over every one of them things? And I never followed up on what was necessary to keep me from losing my marbles again. It's a cooperative effort. My sponsor told me God provides the guidance and he provides the power. But, son, you do the footwork. No footwork, no progress. I have a disease, if you haven't guessed that already. Alcoholics Anonymous said I was sick. I have an illness. I live in a body that won't handle alcohol. Every time I put alcohol into this body, my body sent me a quick message. Hey, Tom, get some more of that stuff and get it right now. Now, the scientists agree that I have a physical problem as an alcoholic. The scientists say I have a biochemical genetic disorder having to do with the hypothalamic control center in my brain. That when I ingest ethyl hydroxide, the acetaldehyde which is formed combines with dopamine in my brain and forms tetrahydroisoquinoline, and I lose control. <laughs> with all that shit in there, how could I help lose control? <laughs> now, Alcoholics Anonymous says, Tom, you're allergic to alcohol. And when you drink alcohol, you have the phenomenon of craving. Now, both of them say the same thing, y'all. Take your pick. We're talking about keeping it simple here, aren't we? I had a problem with my mind, you know, as an alcoholic. Science agrees with that. Science says I have this narcissistic, egocentric core dominated by feelings of omnipotence, intent at all costs on maintaining its own inner integrity. Alcoholics Anonymous says I'm strangely insane. I have this crazy idea that someday, somehow, if I just handle it right, I'm going to be able to control and enjoy my drinking. Both of them are right. Take your pick. And then science gets left behind. The only Alcoholics Anonymous says I have a spiritual malady. They even describe it for me. Man, it's wonderful how that big book is. When, when your eyes open up to it, I thought mine never would open to it. You know, It talks about the spiritual malady. It says I'm like an actor that wants to run the whole show. It's forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in my own way. That I'm selfish, that I'm egocentric, that I'm self-centered, that I'm a victim of the delusion that I can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if I only manage well. Y'all ever read those words? And that this is the root of my problem. And it tells me why. <laughs> See, if I'm going to run the world, i got to control y'all. That means i got to con, lie, shuck, and jive, manipulate, scheme, cheat, steal, anything I can do to get things going my way, and I did. And y'all didn't like it. <laughs> Damn you. And a wall came up between you and me. And I got cut off from you. I got disconnected, separated, isolated, alone. And when I was cut off from my brothers and sisters, I was, in fact, also cut off from my higher power. Self-will run riot caused me to be absolutely alone on the other side of a wall that I had built. And that's the essence of being spiritually sick. And AA offers a solution. God, it's so beautiful in its simplicity. First of all, it says we had to quit playing God. Next, 
we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be the director. He's the principal. We're his agents. He's the father. We're his children. Most good ideas are simple, it says. And this concept was the keystone of a new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. That's the recovery process. And it ain't done. It goes on over on the next page, and it says, you know, next we launched out on a course of vigorous action. The first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us had never attempted. And what it's saying to me is, identify those stones in that wall that you have built. Name them. Are they built of resentment? Are they built of guilt? Are they built of remorse? Are they built of fear? Are they built of dishonesty? And then when you write all this down, take it to someone that you trust and share with him what you found to check its accuracy to deflate your ego. And then it says, ask God <laughs> to remove the parts of that wall that are standing in the way of your usefulness to him and your fellows. And baby, you cross over. You cross over. And then you make restitution to your brothers and your sisters. And you reconnect with them. And when you reconnect with them, you reconnect with God. And when you reconnect with God, He restores your right mind. The obsession is gone. And if the obsession's gone, you don't drink. And if you don't drink, you don't experience the phenomenon of craving. World without end. Amen. Now, this is just too simple for some people. Can't be that easy. Intellectuals have a hard time in this program, I know. The real low-bottom drunks are intellectuals and very religious people. Intellectual, I'm trying to explain to him about my sobriety. He said, man, you must be a strong person to be sober as long as you have. I said, no, it was by accepting my devastating weakness that I started getting well. And he said, that makes no sense and doesn't. He said, oh, book you read. The commas are in the wrong places. It's got tenses that are wrong, you know, verb tenses and everything are wrong, and it's the sorriest book I've ever read in my life. Matter of fact, the American Medical Association reviewed it in 1939 and found, quote, absolutely nothing of redeeming value in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, end of quote. I'll match AA's results against the Journal of the American Medical Association any day in the week, baby. And it is a badly written book. Hell, it's written by a drunk. <laughs> stream of consciousness, you know. And when a drunk's going stream of consciousness, it's turn left, turn right, go up, go down. You know how it is. And he said, well, how do you stay sober? I said, I go to meetings. Oh, group therapy. And those are just a bunch of drunks get together and talk to one another. Lie a lot, too. And he said, that makes no sense. And I said, I know it doesn't. He said, what else do you do? So I have a sponsor. Oh, a psychotherapist. No, sir, he's a plumber. <laughs> you see? And he says, that makes no sense. I said, I know it. Well, what else do you do? I got this program. Oh, the great metaphysicians and psychologists and theologians got together and, and laid you out a path. And no, sir, it's put together by a bunch of drunks. Now he's pulling his hair. That don't make no damn sense. I said, I know it doesn't. He said, who put this program together anyway? And I said, a failed stockbroker and a proctologist who had lost his ass. And he said, that makes no sense. And I said, I know it doesn't. <laughs> he said, well, how does it work? I said, real good. <laughs> it's not a thinking person's program. Alcoholics shouldn't think anyway. Every time I see that sign in the meeting room that says, think, 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 I want to run up there and put don't, don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> God chooses strange messengers, y'all. Read that old Bible sometime. 
Some of y'all have. You remember Ezekiel? Ezekiel walked around in the valley of dry bones. And they got up and hooked together and started dancing, man. He saw wheels inside of wheels way up in the middle of the air. I believe to this day, Ezekiel had too much of that Mogan David. How about Elijah? Man run naked in the desert, eating grasshoppers. That's a strange person. Never, never cut his hair, never cut his beard, you know? Didn't use unarmed deodorant. God chose Elijah. God chose Moses. The Bible says Moses was slow of speech. That meant Moses stuttered. Did you all know that? If what had happened to me happened to Moses, I'd stutter too. <laughs> I mean, you go up on a mountain, you know, and, and, and you say, who are you? And this big voice comes down and says, I am. And a bush lights up. Right after I peed in my pants, I'd have started stuttering too. <laughs> And God chose Moses. He said, go down to Egypt and get my kids. Moses said, I can't, 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 can't go. <laughs> God said, I'll send your brother to do talking. You going. Moses went. How about a carpenter? Wasn't it said that can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, I'm going to tell you something. God tells you to go somewhere, you're going. Remember Jonah? God said, go to Nineveh. Jonah said, I ain't going to no Nineveh. Go on a boat, man. Went the other way, fast as he could go. Come a big storm. They had to throw him overboard. Big fish swallowed him up and spit him out. Do you remember where he spit him out? In Nineveh. <laughs> the moral of that story is, in case you can't get it, if God tells you to go to Nineveh, your ass is going to Nineveh. <laughs> So what is so strange about God choosing, listen to me, what is so strange about God choosing a failed stockbroker and a proctologist who are drunks and hopeless to deliver the message to those of us who are drunks and are hopeless? God, that's poetry of the highest order. You know that? God's poet. That's beautiful. You know, that's beautiful. I think it is anyway. The old big book describes me pretty well. It says I'm an idealistic, perfectionistic, hypersensitive, romantic dreamer who's never been satisfied with life or me or you as you were. I always wanted more. It says I'm a person who's so afraid that the evil and corroding thread of fear shoots through the fabric of my existence. That's scared, baby. And I was scared, and I had a lot to be scared about. I was the ugliest baby you ever saw. <laughs> People say, how you know that? I said, my mama told me. <laughs> I told a psychiatrist that one time. He said, ooh, must have been traumatic when your mama said that. I said, no, sir, I've seen my baby pictures. <laughs> Mama's right, I was ugly. And it didn't get much better as I started growing up either. I was a skinny little old boy, you know. And, and, and Mama made me wear knickers. And you guys had to wear knickers when you were growing up. And my leg is this big and the knicker hole was this big. And it's always falling down. I spent half my life pulling up them damn knickers. Somebody said to me not long ago, hey, Tom, knickers are coming back. I said, not on my ass, ain't <laughs> And I had freckles. Now, I love freckles on other people. I truly do. I had freckles all over my body, soles of my feet to the tip of the longest hair on my head, I swear. And I was skinny. And I had freckles. And I had, I always wanted to be a macho man, big and strong, you know. And Mother had four brothers, you know. And one of them, my Uncle Durwood, who they called Dud's the most macho man I ever met in my life. Dud's a motorcycle cop in the days when they wore riding breeches and leather spats up to their knees, and he had a harness across here with silver bullets in it, you know. Pearl handle 38 sitting high on his hip, smelled like gunpowder and shaving lotion, and he squeaked when he walked, and by God, that's macho. 
And I wanted to be macho like my Uncle Dud, and on top of them freckles I had this great shock of snow white hair. And all my machos called me Puddinhead. <laughs> now, it's hard to be macho when people call you Puddinhead. <laughs> the only time I wasn't scared, the only time I wasn't guilty and angry is when I was sitting behind my Uncle Dud on that Harley Davidson mo police motorcycle with my arms wrapped around him. I was in heaven. I wasn't afraid of anything. You know what I mean? Even then, in retrospect, I needed a higher power. Uncle Dud's my hero. He's 86 years old now. He's still the most macho man. Can lie. That man can lie bigger than anybody ever heard in my life. And I love every lie he tells, man. He's still my hero. It just tickles him when I say that. He got real sick. He had blood clots all in it. And I went to the hospital up in Burlington, North Carolina to see him. I walked in his room. I didn't say, hey, how are you or nothing. I said, you can't die. He said, why? I said, because I won't have a hero. And he said, okay, I won't die. And by God, he didn't either. <laughs> you know, we need heroes, folks. Hear me. We need heroes in this program. We do not need idols. Idols are these poor folks that we take and put up on a pedestal and demand perfection of. And the first time they screw up, we destroy them. Too much of that is going on. That's personalities above principles. Heroes are those people that live by principle. <laughs> Heroes get out there where the work's to be done. When they screw up, they get up, and they try it again. When they skin their knee, they get up and plaster it over, and they try again. They keep on keeping on. These are the heroes. These are the people I can follow because they don't pretend to be something they're not. And we need them. And I wouldn't be here tonight but for my heroes in this program. I've got to tell you that. I would not be here. And there are many. Some of them dead, but they ain't dead. You know what I mean? As long as I'm alive, they ain't dead. Because what I carry in me is their message. I didn't like me as a kid. And so it was very necessary that you liked me very much. I didn't accept me as a kid, so it was very necessary that you accepted me. And so I shone in everything I did. I was the most disgustingly perfect little boy you ever saw in your life. And you all accepted me, and you appreciated me, and you lauded me, and you praised me, and I still didn't like me. I had this deep sense of being worthless. And no amount of praise could build it up. And that stuck with me long into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it sticks with many of you out there right now. Some people call it lack of self-esteem. I don't call it that. I call it self-loathing. Wonder if you got it? Take a day and watch how many times you put yourself down during that day. When somebody says to you, I love you, do you start giving them five or ten reasons why they shouldn't? If they tell you you did a good job, do you tell them you should have done better? When you ask that loved one, do you love me? And they say, yeah. You say, really? You sure? How could you love me? Do you do things like that? Better take a look. Better take a look. And so I got acceptance and approval. I was very much the actor. I had that stage character I showed to the world, like it says in the sixth chapter. And then there was the inside of me, which was a mush. I didn't have a storybook childhood. Who does? But for a long time, even in sobriety, I couldn't see anything except what bad happened to me, what Mama did, what Daddy did, what they didn't do, you know? And as I look back from the years, things begin to balance out. It's funny how you can look back on your childhood and you can see a good thing, and then you can see two. You've got to see that first one first, and then you can see three. I don't care how horrible your childhood was. There was those private, precious moments when life was good. I was a very fortunate kid. I had an extended family. I lived in a mill town down in North Carolina, Textile Mill Village. Everybody on that side of the street was my family. Not my name, but my family. I played at your house, slept at your house, ate at your house. If I misbehaved, I got punished at your house. And the way they punished us down there was swift and sure. They said to us, quite simply, boy, you do that, I'll whoop your ass. And when you did it, they did. 
Wasn't anything abusive about it. It'd be called child abuse today, you know? Y'all know any victims? Victimhood's a growth industry in this country. I know there are victims. I feel sorry for them. My hat goes, heart, heart, heart goes out to them. But I also know that I was a victim for years, and until I forgive those who victimize me, I remain a victim forever. And to forgive does not mean to like or understand or justify. To forgive literally means to give up resentment, to give up the need to retaliate. You know, every other person I meet nowadays is a victim. I'm getting kind of tired of it. And my, 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 one of my favorite bands, the Eagles, they're getting tired of it too. They got an album out called Hell Freezes Over, just won an award, you know. There's a song on there that says, I turn on the tube and what do I see? A whole lot of people saying, don't blame me. They point their crooked little fingers at everybody else, spend all the time feeling sorry for themselves. Victim of this, victim of that. Your mama's too thin, your daddy's too fat. Get over it. <laughs> all this whining and moaning and pitching a fit, get over it. It's like going to confession. Every time I hear you speak, you're making the most of your losing streak. Some call it sick, but I call it weak. You drag it around like a ball and chain. You wallow in the guilt. You wallow in the pain. You wave it like a flag. You wear it like a crown. Got your mind in the gutter bringing everybody down. Bitch about the present and blame it on the past. I'd like to find your inner child and kick its little ass. <laughs> I was blessed as a child. The lady that lived next door to me was the, the best cook on the block. Her name was Lena. The best eater on the block, too. <laughs> I used to love to hug Lena, man. I'd go up there, and when you hug Lena, you had a titty in both ears. <laughs> it wasn't nothing sexual about it. It's like being enveloped with warm, fleshy love, you know? <laughs> and she rubbed me on the head and said, I love you, pudding, and I'd just go, mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish she was here tonight. <laughs> Lena had a son named Bill Jr. He's one of my special friends. Bill Jr. had his black, kinky, curly hair, you know? And he didn't like it. He wanted to be straight like mine. Uh, it's funny what you remember. I remember finding a can of lard one day, and I straightened out Bill Jr.'s hair. <laughs> and momentarily, he was happy. He's one of those little boys that was programmed for destruction. You, you never saw him. He wasn't skint, busted, scraped, or stitched. You know what I mean? Boy tried to kill himself. Awful. He hated to bathe. <laughs> His mama put him in the tub. She turned her back. He'd escape. <laughs> She'd come out on the porch and say, Puddin', he's loose again. <laughs> there go Bill's naked ass flying down the street. <laughs> Bill running down toward Clay Hill, which is a big pile of red mud, you know, that the, the railroad brought in. It's going to do something with it, but they never did. And it rained. It'd get slick. We'd get box tops and slide down Clay Hill. Tell me about a spiritual experience. Oh, we think they're so big, don't we? They're common every day occurrence when you're washed with beauty and goodness. I had the finest daddy who ever walked the face of God's earth. He was the sweetest, gentlest, kindest man I have ever known. He was also very straight. He was a man of few words. I remember after I began drinking, I was drunk one night, and I'd been reading The Prodigal Son. And I said to my daddy, well, give me what's mine, and I'll go. He said, you're wearing it. Get your ass out of here. <laughs> he was a good man, and he taught me a lot of things. You know, he taught me how to skip a flat rock across the top of the water. You ever done that? Tell me how to drink water out of the creek just after it goes over the rock, son. That's where it's the coolest and the cleanest. Get it right there. Pointed out trees, you know. That's a scaly bark tree, son. That one over there is a china berry tree. We call them chaney ball trees down here in North Carolina. Oh, I loved him. He never said very often, I love you. He didn't have to. You know people like that? Being around him was like being in love exuding to you. 
God, he was a wonderful person. My mama was a black belt Southern Baptist. <laughs> Lord God, me and her fault. She demanded perfection of me. I made straight A's. I bring the report card home, and she'd find something wrong with it. You know, I hated my mother for a long time. I blamed her for everything that was wrong with me, and I had a lot of psychiatric help with that, too. You know what? Mom's dead now. She wasn't. And I called her tonight and said, Mama, I need you to come to Kansas City and die for me. My mother would be right there. There's different kinds of love. Some people know how to show it. Some people don't. Mama didn't, God bless her heart. In her later years when she got Alzheimer's, she hugged and kissed and loved me more than she'd ever loved me in my entire life. Phenomenal woman. Brilliant woman with a sixth grade education. She could run AT&T if she had to. Old man Lucas would come out of the house sometime going down to slop the hogs, you know. And he'd call me, and I'd jump in the wheelbarrow with the hog slop and ride on out to hog pen. And while he slopped the hogs, fed the hogs for you uninitiated, you know. <laughs> I'd go over and catch crawdads in the creek and wade and drink that cool water. Walk on home barefooted because Mama wasn't there and she didn't know I had my shoes off. And I'd lay down in the front yard and look up at a cloud and say, God, that's pretty. I wonder who made that. I wonder where it went, and I wonder where it came from. Then I'd get up and go about my business. I went to the movies every Saturday to see my heroes. cost me nine cents to go to a double feature movie, Western. Five cents for a box of popcorn. The man next door ran the theater, ran out of popcorn, stick your box out there. He filled it up. He knew he didn't have any money. Nobody did in the mill, mill town. And every Saturday, I'd go down and I'd watch, you know, uh, Hop Along Casty, a Durango Kid, Rocky Lane, Wild Bill Elliott. And some good cartoons, you know? Not this monster crap they have on TV now. I'm talking p -p 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 Porky Pig, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and, and Wiley Coyote, who's one of my role models to this day. <laughs> Wiley e. Coyote, genius. And see a couple of cereals on top of that, all for nine cents. Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers, any of y'all remember them? The original spacemen really flew in Budweiser can. <laughs> My favorite cowboy was Lash LaRue. They called him Lash because you draw down on Lash, he had a bull whip, and he'd whip that gun out of your hand. Lash was cool. <laughs> I'd watch an old Lash one day, and he'd stand on the roof of the saloon looking macho, you know, like they can do it. He'd run all the bad guys out of town. He popped his whip and whistled, and his horse come running by. He popped his whip again, leapt into the saddle, and rode off into the sunset. And so help me God, tears came to my eyes. I said, God, look at Lash. That is wonderful. And I sat through that movie again and again and again to see him do that. Then I went home, and I got a piece of rope, and I went up on the garage. <laughs> and a little bit, boy next door had a pony named Beauty. I said, John Q, saddle up Beauty. And he did. I said, now walk her past the garage. And he did. And I popped my rope and whistled and leapt into the saddle. And when I hit it, you could hear me scream in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I don't know if that was a spiritual experience or not, but I ain't never forgot it. <laughs> and 30 minutes later, when I got my breath back, I started wondering about Lash LaRue now. <laughs> I had a good life. I had a good life. But every once in a while, I'd sit up the Cheney Ball tree and do some deep thinking. And I'd say, I've got a fine daddy and a fine mom and a good neighborhood to live in, good movie to go to, nice heroes. But something's missing. Don't ever do that. I don't know what it is. I don't know where to look for it. But I know if I ever find it, everything's going to be wonderful. When I was 15, I thought I'd found it. When I was 15, I drank some of the foulest tasting stuff you ever drank in your life, a substance called Cream of Kentucky. And that big empty space I'd had inside of me, that's something that was missing? Oh, it was gone. And I said to myself, I found the elixir of life. I'm never going to be without this stuff again. All my friends got drunk that night and puked. I didn't. When they was all passed out, I called that cab driver back and I got me a pint of Cream of Kentucky. I was off and running. I had found the magic stuff that changed me instantly with little or no effort on my part. It felt good. 
Y'all remember? And it almost killed me. By the time I was 16 and 17, I was showing up in the Wake County Jail in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I then lived. I picked up for drunk driving. I was picked up for public drunk. I was picked up. I never remember being locked up a single time. I was a blackout drinker from the very beginning. I remember coming to in jail and wondering why I was there. And the fear that I'd always had was always magnified. By the time I was 23, I'd had over 1,000 stitches taken in my face alone as a result of drinking. See, I liked to drive cars when I was drunk, and I could drive the straightest line you ever saw. I just couldn't turn a damn curve. <laughs> and here's this brilliant kid that all his teachers said he's going to make a mark on the world. I was making a mark, all right, on a lot of trees and a lot of fenders, you know. I even drove under a tractor trailer one night. That's what you do when you're having fun. I got to speed it up tonight. They told me the band's got to start soon. So. Hell, I'm going to talk till I'm done. <laughs> I have never suffered in my life like I suffered after I found the magic elixir of life. I hated my guts. I hated everything about me, even deeper than I had before. I had no friends. I drank them all up. Do you understand what I mean? Some of you do. I drank them all up. They didn't want anything to do with me anymore. <clears throat> My boon companions. When I was about 23, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't remember why. I must have been in trouble. And I've always had a good mind. I've got a partial photographic memory. Memorizing things is no problem to me. And I came in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was just going to do it just like I did the sixth grade. Memorize everything there, spit it back to the teacher, and I'd be cured. And I went to my first meeting on one side's 12 steps, on another side's 12 traditions. Up front's a guy with a blue book in front of him, and he's in control. I've always liked control. I know y'all haven't. I know if I pull the bus of life into this room tonight, everybody in here would go for the steering wheel. And al -Anons would be first by God. Now, I memorized what was there, and I memorized what I memorized what was in that book. I can quote great portions of the book Alcoholics Anonymous to you tonight. The blessed difference is I don't have to anymore. I'm a living example that you can have everything you need to know up here, and until it gets to your feet, it means nothing. A spiritual program must be walked, not thought about and felt about and taught. I didn't know that. I'd never done things that way before. I'd always excelled by being first. That meant smartest. Knew it, knew it, knew it. Could quote it. And for the next seven years, the longest I ever stayed dry was 89 days. And you know what it feels like to be that close to the switch and be unable to reach it? I remember hearing old Chuck C. say one time, the turtles of life were passing me by like they're riding motorcycles. <laughs> and I'm standing there saying, what is wrong with me? There was a lot. I met some of the hatefulest people I ever met in my life in Alcoholics Anonymous. They were ugly and profane. And they talked in circles. And they called them old timers. I didn't like him. And one old boy in Burlington, North Carolina, named was Bill C. I called him Grumpy. I hated his guts. He'd wait for me at meetings. <laughs> he denied it, but he did. I know he did. As soon as I walk in the door, he'd point his finger at me and say, Boy, how you doing? I'm fine. Then he'd get profane. And then he'd push me in the corner with that finger and tell me how I was. That's scary, man. When somebody can read your insides, and the man was ultimately stupid. He talked in circles. 
Boy, you can't think your way into good living. You got to live your way into good thinking. I'd think to myself, shut up, you old bastard. <laughs> but I didn't say anything to him because I was scared of him. You know, you know the feeling? Boy, how come you always running around looking for God? God ain't lost. Oh, I love that one. I'm out there in a college studying philosophy, theology, Greek, and Hebrew, excelling again. <laughs> Had my own dance man, finished college with majors in philosophy and history and minors in religion, Greek, and English, a 3.94 average. Who's who among students in American universities and colleges? Two years running. Outstanding biblical student. That's pretty good for a drunk. I won every award there was to win, and I was dying. Grumpy knew it. Oh, he tried to help me. I always called when it was too late for help. Booze was gone, test patterns off TV. I'd say, well, shit, I need some help. <laughs> I called Grumpy early one morning and told him I need some help. I could say a word. He said, boy, don't you ever call me again, drunk. He said, matter of fact, don't you ever call me again. You want to get sober, you know where we meet, and don't call me to come get you. You can walk. And frankly, as far as I'm concerned, I don't give a damn if you ever get sober. I'm a sensitive alcoholic. <laughs> you can't imagine what I said about that man that night. And tonight, I bless him. Hear me, I bless him. And Grumpy is one of my heroes. And Grumpy never changed. The last time I saw him, he was dying of bone cancer in a hospital in Wilmington, North Carolina. I'd been sober 16 years then. And I walked in the door, and up came the faker, and he said, Boy, you'll never make it. <laughs> On the morning of July 20th, 1965, I was brought low. I had to quit doing things my way. I had to. See, I tried to work the program my way. I read what it said. I did what it said, but I did it in solitude. This is not a solitude program. The magic of this program is the first word in the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the first word in the first forward of the first edition of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that word is we. And anybody who tries to reach that switch alone will never reach it. But we can do what I alone cannot. I used to love to meditate, man. Up in North Carolina, we give a red chip for 90 days. You know, I wanted one so bad, I pasted one on the calendar. I used to go up after meetings and steal red chips. <laughs> I wanted to be somebody. Can you understand this? And I was sick and tired of being nothing. And I'd done gone through all the other steps, and I figured meditation's interesting. I found out who the best meditators were. These guys shaved their heads and wore these orange bathrobes. <laughs> Crossed up their legs real funny and chanted, Om... I couldn't find an orange bathrobe anywhere. <laughs> so I wore my old dirty blue terry cloth drinking liquor bathrobe like Beth was talking about last night. It was filthy. I'm too vain to shave my head. And I'd busted up my legs so many times having wrecks drunk that I could get into lotus position, but I couldn't get out of it. <laughs> but you got to do it right, you know, so I'd have to get my wife to help me get into lotus position. It hurt. And I'd chant, mm, mm. And God's got a sense of humor. I see him up there looking down, him and Peter, and God say, there he is again. <laughs> Peter say, who? God say, Puddinghead. <laughs> he got on that stinking bathrobe. I wish he had burned that thing. He wants a spiritual experience. He wants a lightning bolt. I'd give him one, but he wouldn't like the color. <laughs> Ooh, talk about arrogance. When I was directing God on how to bring about my salvation. God. And he took it. And he'd say to Peter, tell me, Peter, 
What does OM mean anyway? <laughs> now, I'm not knocking that. That's an ancient, honored spiritual tradition, but there was an idiot using it. <laughs> but I hit bottom, and I made a profit out of Grumpy. See, I didn't have a driver's license, so I was never supposed to drive again in the state of North Carolina. I was on five years probation with two years active sentence on the chain gang hanging over my head if I was caught drunk. And I came to in the middle of the floor. And I knew a couple things real clear. <laughs> First time in my life it got past here and got down here. You can't drink, Tom. And you can't, you can't quit. God, I understood what power was. Not here. You can't drink, you can't quit. What else are you? And you're going to die. And I would walk back to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't want to go. There was no place else to go. You understand? And I went late and I left early. I didn't say anything to anybody, but they did to me. Oh, man, we'd be glad to see you. They told me those lies, you know. We need you here. You're important to us, at least to me. They were like, and I think to myself, if they knew me, they wouldn't be saying that stuff. I'm the all-time loser in this universe. And they kept on saying it. And they found out I was walking. I never walked again. First two years I was sober, I went to meeting every single night, sometimes twice a day, and never walked again. A car would pull up in front of the house every night. They'd ask me if I wanted to go to meetings. Pull up in front of the house, blow the damn horn. <laughs> and I went to meetings. I didn't know why I was doing it. It just seemed like the thing to do. <laughs> so it's called group sponsorship, you know. I, they didn't give me their number and say, call me. They said, give me your number. I get six, seven, eight, ten phone calls a day from these people at that group. How you doing? We hope you're doing okay. Anything I can do for you? Y'all still got group sponsorship out here? Or you just toss your phone number to the newcomer? God bless them, they didn't. They saved my life. I kept going in that group, you know, and I, I saw this man there that I liked. And I, I liked his eyes. I had the greatest eyes I've ever seen in my life. It sparkle right out of his head. I couldn't look at him. I couldn't look at nobody. They might see me. Y'all know what I mean. They might see right down in there and see what was there, man, and say, get the hell out of here. And I sat up this man one night, and I said, uh, I'm Tom. I don't want to die. Will you be my sponsor? He turned on me and pointed his finger and said, boy, I've heard about you. They tell me you're not just an alcoholic. They tell me you're crazy. But I'll help you on one condition. I said, what's that? He said, we will do it my way. And I don't know but one way, and it's in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. You want me to do that, son? I said, yes, sir. You ever notice how your sponsor seems so wise and erudite until you ask them to be your sponsor, and then they go stupid on you immediately? <laughs> well, that's what Harry did. He went stupid on me right away. <laughs> he said, first thing I want you to do is go to meetings early and shake everybody's hand and ask them how they're doing. I said, I don't want to go to meetings early. I don't want to shake your hands. I don't care how to do it. I just don't want to die. And why do I have to do that? And he said, boy, you don't ask me why. You do what I tell you to do. Now I've got a master's degree in counseling. I hope you're impressed by that. I'm not. <laughs> but if I told a client to do that, go to meet and shake everybody's hand and ask them how they're doing, the next thing I'd say is, how does that make you feel? My sponsor didn't give a shit how it made me feel. <laughs> my... Please don't misunderstand me. No one cared more about my feelings than my sponsor. But he knew that no matter how I felt, good or bad, there were certain things I must do. This is a spiritual program, remember. And I dooed it, man. I shook everybody's hand, looked at the floor, mumbled. I knew he was watching me, so I didn't miss nobody because he'd embarrass me. And after a few weeks, I saw some ankles. And I saw some shin. <laughs> saw some knees. Saw some thighs. Saw some of the prettiest hips I'd seen in a long time. <laughs> and finally I saw their eyes. And I realized something. I was glad to see them. God helped me 
I did care how they were doing. And they did too. I was connected. You got that? Greatest thing. Man, I started changing. People say, man, you're getting good. And people on the faculty at the college where I work say, we don't know what you're doing. But whatever it is you're doing, keep on doing it. You're a much nicer person. I said, well, thank you. I didn't know I was changing. So one day I was sitting in my office eating a bag lunch, you know, and all of a sudden it dawned on me. You haven't wanted a drink for over three months. And I sat there and cried like a baby. I didn't know what was happening to me. You know, God comes when he wants to. They say he comes like a thief in the night. That's the way he did to me. Tapped me on the shoulder and said, oh, boy, you're getting well. I was sharing with Ted tonight. I, when, after I took my six and seven step, I was down a little chapel, St. Simon's Island in Georgia, and I was sitting there, and, and I was contemplating the, the stained glass window behind the pulpit, you know, and, and there was a picture of Jesus up there. I looked at it, and inside my head I said, where's the cross? And a voice came to me just as clear and said, it's been removed, Tom, and so has yours. Man. You know, and things started happening like that. My dog stopped running away from me. <laughs> Started licking me on the face, my wife licking on the other side, you know. And my kids would come to me and call me daddy. Oh, y'all taught me so much about love. You have taught me that emotional love is a feeling. It is based on hormones. You see somebody and the hormones rise. And you say, I love you. <laughs> Six weeks later, when the hormones go down, you roll over and look at her and say, who's this bitch? <laughs> and spiritual love. You have taught me that spiritual love means responsible behavior toward other human beings based on care, respect, concern, and acceptance for that human being. It's an action, not a feeling. Feelings come and feelings go. Real spiritual love remains. And the way they put it in alcoholic. And the way they put it to us in Alcoholics Anonymous is real simple. Y'all ever heard this? You do not have to like everybody, but you must love everybody. The difference in feeling. Man, things got good, you know. That daddy of mine, you know, when I was 18 years old, I had an option from a judge. <laughs> go to jail or go to service, and I got patriotic. <laughs> and my daddy loved me to death, and he took me down to that bus to go to the United States Air Force, telling me how much he loved me with his hand planted firmly on my ass, pushing me on that bus. <laughs> he wanted me out of his life, and I don't blame him. I was driving him and Mama crazy. And Daddy died. I've been sober a good while. He died with lung cancer. And it's ugly. But it's beautiful. You understand what I mean? And I sat with him and I found out how much strength he had. Morning before he died, he turned over and he asked me, Son, am I going to die? And I said, Yes, sir, the doctor says you are. And he said, When? I said, The doctor says it will be real soon. Does that frighten you? And here's my daddy. He's not a member of AA. He said, yes, son, of course. But I learned a long time ago, when you're scared, you give the fear to God and go about your business. And he looked at me and he gave me the greatest gift he had ever given me. He said, Tommy, I love you. You're one of the finest men I have ever known. You know what several people have told me? God blows my mind. You know, I always want to be like my daddy. He's my number one hero. And sometimes people tell me, you know, Tom, you're the sweetest, kindest, gentlest man I've ever met in my life. And I say, thank you, God. And my son Jason, you know, tells me it's okay to tell you he's in the program almost four years now. <laughs> he stood up and introduced me at a meeting not long ago to speak. He said, our speaker tonight is the finest man I know. He's my father, and he's my hero. What gift is greater than that? What gift could be greater than that? Than having God save you and bring you full circle and change you from a loser into one of his children. 
contingent on my continuing to give away every single thing that he has given to me. Now, I've changed. I've changed radically. I'm going to change some more. I like changing. I don't like staying the same. Life hadn't been a picnic for me. The last five years has been a bitch, y'all. It's been the worst five years I've had in my sobriety. Had six or seven surgeries, one of them for cancer. I had cancer. I have emphysema. I have high blood pressure, deep venous thrombophlebitis. I married a beautiful woman that I love with all my heart. She walked out on me. Never loved a woman like that. Doubt if I've ever really loved one before until her. She walked out. Almost went bankrupt. My mother got Alzheimer's. My sponsor got Alzheimer's. Seemed like there was no end to it. When she walked out of my life, it was my li- like my life walked out with her, you know, and I realized how much of myself I had invested in this human being. And we alcoholics have a tendency to do that. When we fall in love, we give that other human being the center of our lives. I didn't realize it was happening, but I knew it, and I didn't want to drink. I wanted to die. I didn't want to drink. I didn't want to drink through any of this. I got me a new sponsor. He said, son, you need to get busy. You need to help some people. I said, to hell with people. I don't want to help nobody. I want to die. He said, that's the reason you're going to help some people. <laughs> you're going to have a couple of pigeons. That's what we call newcomers. You're going to have a couple in a couple of weeks, or I ain't going to work with you, and I ain't got the solution to your problem or the answer to your questions. But I'll tell you what we can do. We can go to some meetings, Tom. <laughs> we have to talk about back to the basics. I said, I won't go to no meetings. The more reason we're going. Every night we're going. And I started pulling back. Started pulling back. The basics. Sometimes y'all newcomers think you got it. You know, you're supposed to be the center of attention. Sometimes us, the old timers, are suffering the pangs of hell. Don't shut us out. See, nobody wanted to hear me talk about my problem. <laughs> hear me. I'm the old timer. I'm the guy that's supposed to give the answers, not ask for them. Don't shut us out. Then my mother died. Less than two months later, that woman that I love with all my heart killed herself in a head-on collision. A few months later, the woman I was so close to in AA that I called her my AA mother and sent her a Mother's Day card every Mother's Day died suddenly. And I did not think about drinking. You got it? Why? Because God had restored me to sanity. The obsession to drink wasn't there. You know, sometimes for the life of me, I think sanity is what this program really gives us. And everything else is like icing on the cake. Thank God for sanity. (laughs) I'm going to shut up a minute. I have a friend in Alabama, and she's got a friend who's a singer, and she gave me one of his tapes one time. said, this song sure does remind me of of you. And and this is a guy that writes top 40 hits for other people, and he sings at churches for free. I like that. And she gave me this song, and I put it on, and I'd like to, if I can, recite the words to you. If I can remember, as if it's a dialogue between me and my my two daughters and my son and me and my mother. God rest her soul. My oldest daughter, Christy, says, Dad, why aren't you famous? I said, Christy, I think I am. Because all the people you see here tonight came out here to give me a hand. But their applause isn't what really matters. It's what I can feel from their hearts. And if tonight I made dreamers of some who had lost them, I made friends with a few who were scared. Or if there's one new believer who came here a critic and I told him that somebody cared. And Christy, I always feel famous. Though I'm not seen on TV, I get all the attention my ego can handle doing this live and for free. You see, I do it live and for free. My daughter Frances says, but Daddy, why are you lonely? And I said, Frances, I guess I am. Because there are many people that I miss tonight who aren't here to give me a hand. But, you know, in some ways they're closer than the people out on the front row. And if I'm quiet, I can hear Chuck C.'s heart beating rhythm and see Grumpy driving his car. And there are preachers and poets that I never met who really have not gone very far. So I'm alone, but I'm not really lonely. I just got a group you can't see. They give me all the companionship my faith can handle doing this talking with me. 
You see, they do this talking with me. And my son says, Dad, I think you're crazy. I said, Jason, that's what keeps me sane. I was born with a strange sense of humor to go with a strong sense of pain. And I found that there's nothing so serious that it can't hold its own in a joke. So I may smile at stories about people suffering and laugh about losing my hat and make people think I give talks without answers because I tease them and hide where they're at. But I also like things that are simple. And the smile is the last thing you'll see on the face of this crazy old outlaw laughing out loud because I'm me. I laugh like this because I'm free. And then Mama, God bless her Baptist heart, says, But Tommy, do you love Jesus? And I said, Mother, doesn't it show? She said, I've been listening to you for an hour, and frankly, I've got to say no. <laughs> but, because if you did, you'd be famous. Big concerts and Christian TV. You'd be so well-known that you'd never get lonely, you'd never be crazy or weird, but you've got to give up giving talks without answers, and you ought to shave off that old beard. And I said, well, I love you too, Mother. But you sure found it different than me. You see, I do my best, and I do it like Jesus, because he did it live and for free. Thank you.